And joining us at the round table this week is Dr. Gary Arthur Thompson, who has taught archeology span and history at McGill University in Montreal for 23 years. And now you're writing and traveling and taking tour groups uh, uh, to the, to the Mideast and all over Europe. And it's nice to have you here, welcome. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. You're from Montreal, but you uh, are really a world traveler. Uh. Right, right. And what we're going to talk about, you write extensively. You're an yes. author and, and you've written uh, about uh, Middle Eastern history and, and uh, biblical times and, and your travels. Right. But we're here this week, appropriately enough, for the 4th of July to talk about your latest book right. that's just come out called Ring Papa Ring which is an interesting title that we'll get to in, in just a moment. Um, you wrote this book with your cousin. That's correct. Tell us why you two decided to get together and collaborate and write this book. My cousin had been accumul accumulating a, mount a mountain of things about our family, and it was all disconnected in one thing or another. And we had this conversation and said, why don't we put this together? So we began an email conversation. He lives in Nebraska, where we came from originally, mm -hmm. and uh, I live in Montreal. And actually, over the last three years, we actually haven't uh, we haven't met personally, uh, straightforward. It's all been by email. It's something like a, it would happen in a Jane Austen era <laughs> or something, you know. That's right. Letters going back and forth, and that's how we began to put it together. And uh, it was a good corroboration. It had a lot of spark to it, you know. And this is your family tree. This is tracing your, your family tree, your family history back in time. That's right. And we will start right off with the title, Ring Papa Ring. That, uh, uh, tell us about uh, the title. Okay. Our great, 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 great grandfather, umpteen generations back, about 11 or 12 generations back, was William Hurry. And he was the caretaker of the Pennsylvania State House, which became known as Independence uh -huh. Hall. And as such, he uh, rang the bell. And on July 4th, actually not July 4th, July 8th, he rang the bell 100 times to uh, bring the people together for the reading, the first reading of the Declaration of Independence that had been signed over a period of time by uh, 55 uh, founders of this country. And the Ring Papa Ring was his son who was there with him telling him to ring the Liberty that's Bell. The, that's the family oral tradition. And I've heard that since I was a little child when the 80-year-old man who lived to be 100 came from the East to live with his daughter in Nebraska and he would stand up and tell this story about William Hurry and how his son was waiting at the door for the thing to be signed, and then he would run up the stairs and say, and as when he ran up the stairs, he said, ring, Papa, <laughs> ring, and uh, a new country was being born. And on July 8th, uh, 1776, not July 4th, as many people probably uh, have, right. have always thought. Right, well there's several dates, and the typical idea is that uh, 55 people were seated there, and John Hancock, for some reason, wrote in big letters, and then everybody else squeezed their name in, 55 of them, all at one sitting. Not so, it took place over two or three months, and John Hancock was faced with a great big sheet of paper, and probably that's why he put it in there so large, you know, when he was signing. That's right. William Hurry and his son uh, fought in the uh, in the Revolutionary War. Right. They uh, and uh, his son-in-law was actually a captain, Captain John McGinley, uh, was had the fort there at Philadelphia and sort of played quarterback, holding the um, British off while Washington moved the troops to Valley Forge for the winter uh, of that year, you know. That's pretty significant. Right, right. So they were all in the war itself. They, uh, they were, the Hurry and his son were foot soldiers, and uh, McGinley, of course, was in the officers. And then you chronicle uh, also your family's history in the Civil War. Right, well. we might put in there, just ahead of that, that uh, 
in another part of the family, there were Kleinfelters uh -huh. in the in Washington's army, crossing the Delaware with him on that night that he turned the Revolutionary War around. You know when he right. took them by surprise on Christmas. That historic moment, yes. It's incredible. And then there are three cousins amongst uh, George the Third's army uh, of fighting cousins. And uh, they have the opportunity, when they meet each other, because three of them are now pr prisoners of war, you know, they have the opportunity uh, to buy them as indentured servants. And they do. And uh, become part of the family in Pennsylvania. Right after the Revolutionary War. Right. Then that's where then everyone went their separate ways and, and one of your ancestors went to Pittsburgh right. and uh, started a, a, a pretty memorable company. Right. He, there was a boiler factory which uh, and then there was another part of the family that was involved in the keel boating of uh, immigrants into the country. This book is actually a lot about immigrants um, and, uh, German immigrants, Scottish immigrants, and what have you. So here he was in Pennsylvania, this particular one, keelboating him, and his five sons became steamboat captains out of Pittsburgh, one of whom uh, was captain when a fellow named Samuel Clemens wanted to learn how to do it. And Clemens came on, the bo uh, on board the SS Pennsylvania of Captain John Kleinfelter, and they made several trips from uh, uh, St. Louis to New Orleans together. And Clemens was saying to Kleinfelder up on the bridge, uh, the depths of the river, because you had to have enough depth for those steamboats to go through. And when he would say two fathoms, that was 12 feet, he would say, Mark Twain. And out of that, he got his pen name. No kidding. <laughs> and then, of course, came the famous book. Right. Exactly. Life on the Mississippi. Incredible. Right. Incredible. Right. And Twain's brother remained on the boat when it blew up because the boiler man who was watching girls instead of watching the monitors of the boilers blew up the ship and he died in the incident. Hmm. But Twain records the incident that Kleinfeller was sitting there getting his morning shave. And he's got his feet on the edge of the what's left of the boat, and the barber is still mixing the uh, the soap <laughs> when Whenever. when the whole thing is over, <laughs> right? Kleinfelter, uh, that uh, is one side of the family, and of course Thompson is the other. And much of the book focuses on your grandparents, on uh, Blanche and Herbert, right? And their uh, and their story together, right? And uh, they. Uh, met in uh, 1905 on a train platform in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and it was love at first sight. Right, right. And they uh, exchanged letters and then were married within a couple of years. Right, right. They, her, they were there because, well, there, there again, it's incredible. Abraham Lincoln passed the Pacific Railroad Act in 1862. Not a spike was driven until 1869. And then in that 40 years, something like 12,000 miles of rail were laid, so that such that they could go from Pittsburgh to Denver, or Colorado Springs, for this 40th anniversary of the end of the Civil War. And that was the reason for their being there, you know. Joseph Kleinfelder uh, was uh, recruited into the Civil War in 1862. He was wounded at Antietam Creek, taken prisoner to Libby Prison in Richmond. Then there was a prisoner exchange, and he was able to go home, uh, recuperate, get married, go back to the battlefield again, and he, his work was an artificer of the cannons. He repaired and lighted and hmm. set off cannons, you know, all, all over the, in many battles. He ends up down in um, Atlanta with General Sherman. He's there on the top of Atlanta, exactly where Jimmy Carter's center is now, shooting down on the city, you know, on the very day that his son, the man I knew, was being born up in Pittsburgh, you know. That was 1864. 
but he was in quite a few battles and he was wounded again. Stayed in Nashville for a few months to recuperate again, but went back to the battle and was with the 60,000 men who marched with Sherman from Atlanta to the sea. Your grandparents then settled in Nebraska and, right. and farmed there, but this is where we get into part of the Cana Canadian connection. Uh, a, a few times they, they moved to a farm in Alberta. That's right. Uh, back and forth a few different right. times. It's an incredible thing. Once again, Abraham Lincoln, who was a real Federalist, gave a fantastic opportunity for people to have homesteads in Nebraska, which is also in the book, and to buy farms and to uh, expand, to be entrepreneurs, everything. And with the railroads, they can move about. Yeah. So within one generation, they're moving around the country, you know. So here is my grandfather in 1913 buying the first electrically lit car and by, and then about 1914, he makes a deal sight unseen for this land in Canada, trading 80 acres in Nebraska for uh, almost a section of land in uh, Canada, hmm. you know, sight unseen. The, and he goes up and checks it out, works it all out, but he doesn't move there till 1920. He moves there in lock, stock, and barrel with his growing family in 1920 to Stetler, Alberta, and farms there for one year. He's fed up, comes back to Nebraska. Seven years later, he returns with his family, and they live there quite a while mm -hmm. before coming back to Nebraska. It's quite a story on, on his part. And they were farmers? Yes, yes. So in the, in the uh, 20s and 30s, obviously a difficult time probably to, for everyone. Right, right. That they survived. Well, this is 1920, right, it is the first time he goes up there right after the First World War. He registers for the war. The draft comes into being at the last year of the First World War, as you remember. Mm -hmm. He registered, we got the number and everything. My, my cousin Dean has documented this thing right down to the Nats Eyelash, you know. Anyhow, 1920, they go to Canada, and uh, uh, then 1928, 1929, they're back again before the Great Depression. They're back in Nebraska. Were they affected greatly by the Depression? They had a lot of land in Nebraska, and the, they were hard workers, and uh, they survived, you know. My father was uh, an accountant to start with, and then he became, took over some farms, and uh, I was born on a farm in Nebraska at that time, you know, 1935, yeah, right. There is also a Canadian connection uh, for our viewers. Uh, way back, uh, some early ancestors uh, settled in Quebec City, the first capital right, of right. Canada. Right, my great-grandfather, the father of Herb, came from Edinburgh, Scotland. And uh, he, his father was a stonemason. He comes across the ocean with a family named Hutchison. And he's in uh, Montreal for a few years with that family. And that family were the stonemasons and architects of the Hotel de Ville in Montreal part of the uh, government buildings in Ottawa, and Erskine Church, in, uh, which is a uh, Scottish church in Montreal. So he, and several other significant buildings actually in Montreal that he was involved with, with this Hutchison family. Then he decides to go west, you know. At the time when uh, the territories were just opening up, it's mm -hmm. before they were, before Michigan or Wisconsin or Nebraska or any of those places were states, this is in the time of the territories, he's out there around 1846, something like that, and things are just beginning to happen. He, he's in Wisconsin when he takes out his citizenship, and from Wisconsin he takes his bride, who also is Scottish, and they go to Nebraska and are part of uh, the territorial scene in Nebraska for, what, 
five, six years before it becomes a state in 1867, mm -hmm. the same year that Canada was confederated and was celebrated, uh, what was it, yesterday? Yes, Canada. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. When you started work on this book, did you have little bits and pieces that you were fascinated by and you said, boy, this looks like a great story here to go and investigate, or did you know any of this and, and um, like your your other books, I'm sure you, you've done extensive research for yes, uh, yes. for your topics. Uh, as you started doing research for this, were you uh, surprised to uncover these bits Absolutely. and pieces? Absolutely. I was surprised at every turn. And I don't think my cousin could fit it into the wider picture of history unfolding. So together we had an interesting uh, dialogue. and. And some days we would have the dialogue back and forth. Like, for example, he turns up this fact that uh, one of these ancestors was in Germany and was about to be recruited by into the army there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he flees with his sister to, Phil uh, to Pittsburgh. But uh, he turns up the German arrest warrant that he, ha he got out of Darmstadt, you know? And, uh, well, there were two or three of them in that same area of Hesse, you know? Where, uh, by the way, there's another thing about uh, history. They often say they were German missionaries, uh, missionaries, not missionaries, mercenaries. Mm -hmm. They were not really mercenaries, they were draftees. The aristocrats needed fodder for their uh, army. And they were just going through the country like Florsbach and what have you, you know, or Darmstadt or Dettighofen, wherever these people were, grabbing them up, you know. So he took the opportunity to flee, you know. We've got the warrant for his arrest in German. He comes to Philadelphia, and a poor boy, and becomes very successful. He starts several companies in Philadelphia, you know, including the first American natural gas company. Hmm. And he sells it in 1926 to John D. Rockefeller, you know. So uh, his is a, is a success story, you know. But that was two or three re weeks' work right there, you know, back and forth. My goodness, this is interesting, you know. Or then you get in, you f suddenly find out that uh, the Ronald family knows Robbie Burns, the Scottish poet. Mm -hmm. And I always loved this poem uh, about turning, uh, turning up a mouse in a field. We slicker, cool, and timorous beastie, what a panics in that breasty. You know, when he's turning over this sod and he's uprooted the nest of the mice, mm -hmm. turns out that the Ronald uh, who was turning it up was none other than one of my ancestors, you know. And then Robbie Burns can't make it as a farmer. He becomes an excise man. He joins up with this smuggler, Thomas Ronald, and they both become government agents, <laughs> excise men, tax collectors, you know, you know. And so on it goes, you know. So, uh, and that was, and then Robbie Burns wrote Cotter's Saturday Night, one of my favorites, in this pub where the barmaid and uh, owner of the, Pub was none other than another one of my cousins, Gene Ronald, you know. So, and then he writes poetry about the Ronalds of the Bennells and so forth, you know. So, it's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, it was incredible, you know, that kind of thing, you know. And as you went along, you kept uncovering these these uh, these exactly, connections. Exactly. Exactly. How yeah. long did you work on the book, you and, and Dean? Three years. Well, he'd been working on it for years, and he'd been dumping this material on me and saying, we ought to do something about this. And then I wouldn't see him for maybe five, 10 years at a funeral or something maybe. And then we start getting together on this thing. And we have different backgrounds, different political philosophies, different religious points of view and everything else, you know. But that added to the mix, you know, to make it into something very interesting, I think. You know. At first, did you think it wouldn't be a story that people would would care about or want to hear until you started yeah, finding yeah. Well, all these? Yeah, well, that's it. I think writing it anecdotally, we decided to go into the chapters we went into. We had the division of Blanche, my grandmother, and Herb. And then we began to take these key things like the Civil War or the Revolutionary War 
or the uh, Homestead Act, the settlement of the Nebraska Territory. My grandfather had the 17th uh, Homestead Certificate. John C. Fremont was there right where he was in Auburn, Nebraska, and it was uh, New Year's Eve, and the Homestead Act came into play January 1st, 1863. And he says, can't you open the uh, shop for me? And the fellow is at the party, he happens to be the judge, he opens the uh, courthouse, lets John C. Fremont sign, and then John C. Fremont is able to go back to do his thing with the Civil War, you know. And 17th in the line there is my grandfather who signs up for his piece of land in Nebraska. You know. He's also involved in the, the uh, s Nebraska city, you see. There was the Oregon Trail, 1842, and it went way up around Omaha, way out of the way. And the U.S. government wanted to move freight through to Fort Laramie, Fort Kearney, Fort, uh, Fort Denver. So they made a they had made a pit stop there. They made a stop right there at Nebraska City, mm -hmm. so that they could cut straight across to Kearney, and that was called the Nebraska City Cutoff. And all of the uh, freighting materials were brought by steamboat to Nebraska City, then loaded on these covered wagons, and taken across the prairies through Nebraska City and west. So. J. Sterling Morton, the fellow who started uh, Arbor Day in the United States, mm -hmm. you know, planting a tree. Yeah. He and my grandfather and a couple of other fellows got the bright idea of starting a steam wagon road because all of these things were being pulled by oxen. And they had 14 mile increments that they had traveled per day. A steam engine pulling uh, a bunch of freight wagons could maybe go 30 miles a day. Mm -hmm. So they got a steam engine into Nebraska City. And then my grandfather set up a pit stop 30 miles into the territory where this engine could, could come to rest the first night out on the way to Fort Kearney. And that's where he put his homestead. And after, uh, oh, the steam engine belched its way up to the top of Nebraska City Hill and quit never to go again, you know. But the Nebraska City Cutoff continued to be very successful, and he ran a store there at that pit stop for a while, and then he built his homestead, you know, right there. Now that bit of the history, was the, had that been passed down to you, or is that something that you've just uncovered in the past three years? Well, just we knew it. Well, we were, I actually worked on the, well, that homestead has been in the family, so I've farmed with my father on that sometimes. So we knew about that. We knew where the cabin was that he first built, and then he built this house right away after that. But uh, I didn't know the bits and pieces, and I had no idea that he was 17th or that you could document all this thing. And my my cousin has gone back and documented all this. You know, I went I went ahead and tried to redocument some things. We made a trip to Germany. Mm -hmm. to Florsbach, and I went to the Lutheran archives in uh, Kassel, Germany, and it goes back to 1711, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I also did some documentation in uh, Philadelphia, and that's amazing what's in there, you know, and the letters of William Hurry, here they are, you know, uh, to the Continental Congress, I need more paint, I've got to plaster this wall, and would you give me some whiskey, because this will get the guys going, okay? <laughs> They're all Scotsmen, you know? <laughs> They're a bunch of Scotsmen and they, <laughs> they love their whiskey, you know? Payment but for the construction crew. That's yeah. it. <laughs> and as you uncovered that, uh, again, just fascinating to, uh, yeah. to learn about, especially about William Hurry and, yeah. and, and yeah. his role. Yeah, well that, again, uh, I was shocked. I happened to be a Presbyterian, or was, uh, and uh, I thought, oh, there were Presbyterians in Philadelphia, there were Quakers, there were everybody else. Yep. Turns out that a lot of these Presbyterians were, had a chip on their shoulder long before they came to America with the king. Mm 
They were part of the nonconformists, the Quakers, the Methodists, yeah. the Baptists, the Presbyterians, and they were all outsiders to the monarchy and its state church in England, and they were given a bad time over there all the time, you know. So when they get over here, they're quite really to sign up and boot the Brits out, you know. The monument that we see to uh, William Hurry, that's, is that right in Philadelphia? Yes, it's at that old pine church, and, and it's basically a churchyard with a lot of uh, uh, 13 star flags, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and there are many, many uh, people in that cemetery there at Old Pine. It's on Pine Street just down from Independence Hall where a lot of these Revolutionary War soldiers are, uh, are uh, interred, you know, yeah. right. For people who think, ah, uh, our family history is probably boring and, <laughs> you know, don't think yeah, yeah. about researching it and, 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 and uh, uncovering the family tree. Yeah. Perhaps your story would be a good example of, uh, of if they do that, they might be surprised by what they exactly. find. Exactly, exactly. I'd like to follow up your, your name. It sounds very interesting to me. Well, uh, <laughs> on one side English, on the other Irish, and yes. I, I bet you're right. At some t at some point, I would love to go back and, and right. do what you did. And, and right. if we uh, were lucky enough to uncover the gems you did, uh, it would certainly be a, right. a family story right. uh, to be proud of. Right, right. An exceptional read, and we appreciate you taking the time to, to come in. P ring, Papa Ring is the title of the book. If folks are interested in, in finding it, where can they find it locally? Simply Amazon.com. It's easiest. And just put in Ring Papa Ring Thompson. And they'll and have up it. And will come, you know. Yeah, it's been on there. It's been doing well, actually. And uh, I was in Philadelphia last two weeks ago and uh, made a presentation at Independence Hall. Mm -hmm. And they were quite taken with it, you know. They're vetting it now, as they say, yeah. modern lingo. Three years of legwork into this book, have you uncovered everything, or do you now look at this and say, ah, maybe we, uh, maybe we continue on? <laughs> I was this week, just two days ago, in Vincennes, uh, Indiana, mm -hmm. where George Rogers Clark was, at the instigation of Patrick Henry, was west of the Alleghenies trying to take the lands the British still he held at the end of the Revolutionary War, and he did so. With a little band of 180 soldiers, he's able to take uh, away from the British six states, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and so forth out there. So that's a fascinating story that I knew, knew nothing about, and it's right at the point where Abraham Lincoln went across the Wabash River into uh, Illinois and started his career shortly after uh, uh, this happened, you know. Maybe. So there's many things to follow up on this kind of thing, you know. And you don't know if uh, any of the, your ancestors were part of that or not. <laughs> so I don't know, but I like, to, I like to link up with history and I think it's like when I studied German, I learned to speak English better. And I think um, this taught me a lot more about American history than I knew. It, and it makes our family much uh, a part of that, that fabric, you know. And obviously for the family, it, uh, it must be wonderful for them, a sense of pride to know that, uh, that so many of your They're family members. They're having a reunion uh, next month. And I don't know whether to go or not. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be those who are very happy about it, I suppose, and those who will uh, maybe not feel the same way, maybe feel left out, you know. You can't include everyone. No, you can't. But right. I'm sure that they'll be happy with the job you guys did. It's a yeah. wonderful book, and it certainly uh, showcases uh, the history of an American family. Thank you very much Gary for Thompson, having me here. Thank you for coming down from right. Montreal and seeing us today, and uh, we right. appreciate it. Right. Thanks. It's been a pleasure.